Hi, and welcome to Soulsful. My name's Nakia, and today, instead of Janet, you have me. Ha ha. <laughs> today, we will be speaking with Miss Jennifer Adams, a associate marriage and family therapist about healthy relationships. So, welcome to Soulsful. Hi, and welcome to Soulsful. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Yes, Janet was in the background this time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. How is everyone today? Welcome, welcome. Yes, welcome. Um, today we have Miss Jennifer Adams, but first we're going to find out what you're working on. So, Janet, what were you working on today? I missed you. Uh, I was um playing catch up and... I worked on what was that thing? What was that graph? Excel, this Excel document um, that I was working on, and then catching up on emails. Why is there so many emails? Didn't everybody go away? And I thought I was gonna be productive, which I didn't do nothing but have family time and fun and drink. But we're not gonna talk about that today. That might, you know, yeah. How about you, Toya? Okay, I'm same boat, kind of playing catch up, and um, uh, had a wonderful call with a with a client for a festival that we may be able to support him in. So it had a great great morning, for sure. What about you, Nikia? I worked on what did I work on? I didn't work on anything. I was finished <laughs> my work, so I didn't work on anything. I just lollygagged all morning, so that was great. How about you, Jennifer? What did you work on today? Um, well, I work, you know, full time. And so um, I've been calling clients, having some sessions, uh, learning some new screening processes that we're doing. Um, and I sent a new marketing client um, a contract yesterday. So I've been after um, an experience, I had to reamp my contract. So sent that over to the new client that's going to be signing. Yes, we know nice. about that. We know about Ooh, that. <laughs> somebody yeah. signing a contract. Somebody signing a contract. I had to re contract. my contract because yes. of something that happened. Yeah, we wow. know about that. Yes. Okay, Lessons okay. Learned. Lessons learned. We know about that. <laughs> okay. So today we are going to be talking about relationships. And we have Miss Jennifer. Jennifer Adams is an associate marriage and family therapist who specializes in trauma healing and is on both the Trauma-Informed Care as well as Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee at San Fernandino Valley Community Mental Health Center. She is also earning her PhD in trauma and disaster relief at North Central University. Jennifer's experience in, of healing her own childhood trauma sparked her desire to help others be free. When she's not supporting individuals with their mental health and wellness, she creates content for her own brand, Runway Red LA, bringing mental health topics into the fashion and beauty realm, and is a marketing agency director at Jada's, Jada, Jada, Jada? J. Adams. <laughs> J.A. Adams Marketing, helping her clients strengthen their social media game. So welcome, Jennifer. Sorry about that. No, that's totally okay. It's kind of funny because it's like with Jennifer Adams, that's why I made it Jay Adams because other um, things were taken. So <laughs> my name is very popular if you were born in the 80s. <laughs> yes, very popular. Jennifer is a very popular name. So tell us about trauma. And, and I have a client who is doing trauma-informed trainings and it's something that I had never heard of before. So can you explain it to us? Yes. So trauma informed um, practices are basically where it's all about the lens that you're looking at. So, for instance, when you're working with clients or, you know, if you're going through something yourself, it's not that people should be saying, you know, like what, you know, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? It's more like what happened to you? It's that change in the verbiage. It's the change in the approach. Um, trauma-informed care can be anything about 
how your office is set up. You know, is it friendly? Is it welcoming? Um, are there colors that could offset or trigger a client? Um, is your waiting room or those kind of things um, acceptable and promoting, you know, different races, different ethnicities, or is it um, not doing that? So a lot of trauma-informed care also goes into um, therapists, doctors, all these kind of things um, of how they treat the trauma. So it's not just like, let me give you a pill and that's it. It's more like, well, what's going on? What are the kind of resources that you need connected to? Um, what are some of the things that you've gone through and how can we help? So a lot of it is understanding what trauma is and that it's different for everyone, right? You have big traumas, you have little traumas, but trauma in general can just affect you not only in relationships, but it can also affect you, um, you know, physically and mentally and also spiritually if you are a spiritual person of any kind. Okay. Wow. You said something really phenomenal that the green room, while some, I would have never thought that could have caused trauma. But now that I think about it, you know how people, well, I know not people, but me even myself, uh, when I've gone to a job interview, waiting in the waiting room, how I guess that's where you get a little, if you're nervous and the nervous energy, I never really thought about, but if the room is bright and exhilarating and there's fun, then you sort of woosah, you know, now that I, um, cause I always remember when people used to come to the radio station and I would be the first person and they'll come in and they'd be like, I'm nervous. And then by the time they, the person opens the door to say, come on back, they'll be like, all right, I'm good. I got it. Jen. And I never thought about it, but then, you know, I'm goofy. So I would do little things. If people told me they're nervous, I was like, why are you nervous? Girl, go get you some water. Or what do you want to talk about? Who made you know? Girl, they got on the set. Look at them and they got on colorful shorts. Or I would say something to make the person, when you look at them, relax. But I never thought about that. The green room. Okay, that is important. Toya, we know about that for when we're doing live streams. Make sure that the green room it's inviting and entertaining while they wait. Okay. Well, Thanks. we innately do that because you're there. And so you make that happen because you. you oh, know what okay. Doing. All right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. But oh, that Thank is you. fascinating. So yeah, it's all those? about your approach. It, it really is. It's, it's how you're approaching someone. So if you're the first person, the first line of contact um, for us, we have receptionists and different things, you know, we're sometimes that first contact, even as a therapist, I might be the first therapist that they feel comfortable about talking with really deep, deep trauma. And maybe they have had previous therapists before, but no one was specializing in trauma, or maybe they just didn't know how to approach it at that time. And I might be that first person, you guys might be those first contacts, and it's all about the approach. So what would you say is the most minute of trauma? I mean, I know it may sound and nothing is untouchable, but could it be the a, a ketchup packet? Um, I'm trying to give as minute as possible to as uh, um, extensive as a 10 car pileup car crash. You know what I'm So I'm trying to give you. But a ketchup what, packet, a ketchup package in it. But the, maybe it's the color. Maybe the color signifies something okay. to somebody okay. on a ketchup. Okay. Because, you know, some ketchup packets are red and some are burgundy. So maybe okay. it's the blood. Maybe they think of blood when they see the color red or something. I, I'm I'm just asking because now I'm starting to look Talk at to things us about that, differently. Talk to us about it. <laughs> well... Um, I have actually heard of ketchup triggering people. I know this is going to sound kind of silly, but I have heard of ketchup triggering um, some clients before um, because it does represent um, they'll kind of go towards blood. Like say something happens and they drop like a plastic ketchup bottle. They might be, you know, if they already have maybe some PTSD from something that happened, oh. you never know if they accidentally drop a ketchup bottle one day and they get triggered. Um, it's... I would say when it comes to trauma, it's kind of hard to define what's like the little traumas and the big traumas. I mean, a little trauma could be, you know, even getting dinged in a car accident, but not, you know, you don't have to go to the hospital, everyone's okay. But that could, if you've already had like maybe a hyper arousal kind of state from when you were a child, maybe you went through childhood trauma um, and you get dinged in a car, that might cause you to kind of have some sort of reaction 
versus, you know, obviously those who have served in war, um, anyone that's been through, you know, a trauma of a miscarriage, you know, uh, terrorism, all of those kind of things are big, but it's kind of like um, a spectrum is what I would say. It's kind of like this line of, you know, what's the degree that the trauma is affecting you? Not always like what happened specifically because different people react different ways. Um, but it's more like, how much does it impact you on a scale of like one to 10, you know, one being like, eh, it affects me a little bit versus 10 being like, I can't get out of bed or I have difficulty making friendships or relationships, those kind of things. So Makes technically sense. do, do people know their trauma points or they learn that through you? Um, I've met both. So sometimes people know that, um, they've gone through some bad experiences and they might just call it anxiety. They might, you know, just say like, I get anxious in these certain situations, but then they might not realize until they hear about trauma that like, oh, that's a trauma response that you're doing. You're either doing like a fight, flight or freeze response. Um, but then some people do become aware and they, they say, uh, you know, in sessions or something like that, that, I've had a lot of losses or I witnessed domestic violence as a child or anything like that um, in California specifically, which is just kind of exciting. Um, it's one of the states that's launching this initiative called ACEs. Um, and this woman called Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, um, she was the uh, just a pediatrician. She went to school and was assessing all these clients and why these kids were having asthma. And she wrote like an incredible book, uh, Beyond the Well, I believe it's called. I bought it, but it's like somewhere in my apartment. <laughs> um, I think it's like over there. Yeah. Um, and she was a surgeon. She went to school. They always tell you to like, you know, assess for different things. And she couldn't figure out why she was having to give this little girl, like nine-year-old girl, um, two rounds of, you know, antibiotics for asthma. And she couldn't figure out what was causing it. Was it environmental? What, like, what was happening? And the mother kept denying different things. And so, you know, um, this, you know, Dr. Nadine, she sat there and she was like, is there anything else that's going on in the home? like that you're noticing when she gets an asthma attack. And the mother proceeded to say, yeah, I actually noticed that she gets an asthma attack when her father punches the wall. Mm. And, you know, the doctor wow. was like, whoa, what? And so, you know, she did research into, you know, various things. And she then later became the California Surgeon General. And she is leading the initiative for ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences um, Screening. Because obviously we are clearly seeing that, you know, a lot of the healthcare system and people are utilizing it more and more because they've gone through things. And it's like, you can't always just put a pill or a medication on it. Does that, do they help? Yes. But that's only part of the problem here. And so they're, they're now kind of initiating this, like, let's screen it because this is what's affecting us later into adulthood. Okay. That's great. Wow. So would you say, um, does, does the, the domestic violence affect them just as much in the womb as it does out of the womb from clinical research? So what's interesting, and I'll even share a little bit about myself because I relate to this. Um, I grew up in a domestic violence home and um, I also have eczema, which if anyone knows what that is, that's basically an autoimmune. Um, it's kind of along the lines of psoriasis, but there's again that spectrum of um, people who have it worse, people who have it less. And what's interesting is that um, when I've gone through my own childhood trauma growing up, they always said like, oh, um, you just need a steroid cream for eczema and that's it. Like you just need this and um, stay away from things you're allergic to. Well, what's interesting now of being a therapist is that there's been a lot of research that has come out saying things that happen in the womb do affect the child. Um, not always, but almost always. It, it's kind of like hard to pinpoint it, but it's like some kids come out totally fine. They're cool. Others, most of the time, they do get affected. Um, and what's interesting is you know, they would just say this thing. And then an article came out where they're like, oh, you know, uh, if you have eczema, change up and eat like a lot more fruits and vegetables. So my mom started doing that. And my skin started clearing up. 
but it's kind of interesting because they always told me my asthma and my eczema was basically because of what I'm eating and that I need to take our steroid cream and that's it. Well, what's so interesting is that my whole childhood for like 20 some odd years um, was domestic violence. I consistently saw my dad um, be an alcoholic. He would, you know, come home and use alcohol as an escape. Uh, he would beat on my mom, beat on my older brother. I was kind of the warrior. I don't know how I like got the strength to do this, but I, you know, as I grew up, I was like enough is enough. And I would get in the middle of it. And I'd be like, you need to stop. You need to go and lay down. And what's interesting about this is, again, we're always told like eczema and different things that happen in the body is caused by maybe what you're eating or stress. Well, now that all this research is coming out and Dr. Nadine Harris talked about asthma and how it would flare up based on, you know, things that were happening within this child's home, I go, oh, my God. I've been told that this is just, oh, what you're eating and stress and blah, blah, blah. But then it was like, no. My eczema, since I had it since I was born, mine's genetic. Um, some people have environmental eczema, but mine's genetic. And it's interesting because I asked my mom, what did you eat when I was in the womb? And she was like, oh, I didn't eat that healthy. I said, oh, okay, maybe that's the reason I came out with like a lot of eczema all over my body. But then what's interesting is now we're seeing this research saying, you know, the environment, the domestic violence that was surrounded. And I asked my mom if there was domestic violence when I was in the womb and, you know, before I was conceived and stuff. And she said, yes. And I was like, huh. So what's interesting is now I'm 34 years old. I have less stress, you know, not around domestic violence and stuff like that. And all of a sudden my skin is clearing up. So it's kind of weird that, you know, now we're learning more and more about, yes, your environment does impact you. And they have done a lot of research nowadays. Like if the baby's in the womb, can they like hear you or can they, um, do those different things. And they've done things like playing music for the baby in the womb and um, looked at like people who struggle with substance abuse. Does it affect the baby? Um, and I think I'm trying to remember the term. It's something uh, infant syndrome where they come out um, because they were like high or drunk. Um, and they do have that in their system and the doctors have to clean it out and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. It's a lot. And I'm definitely seeing Latoya talk about, you know, domestic violence having long term and um, whether you witness it as a child or you go through it directly, male or female, because domestic violence can happen, you know, for both sexes and whatever gender pronoun you prefer to, you know, classify yourself as. We are seeing that a lot of these things end up progressing. And it's not even just physically showing up, but your attachment styles to your parents later go into how you date and who you're attracted to and all of those kind of things. Wow, well, and you know, I have asthma, but I never thought about it. Well, I they told me I got asthma. Okay, I'm Caribbean, so don't laugh when I tell you this. My brother had asthma, my dad was a smoker, um, but my brother had asthma and he drank lizard soup. And he got rid of his, but that's because they were in the Caribbean when he drank it. Um, I didn't develop asthma until I came to the States, but it wasn't until like I was 11, 12. However, <clears throat> they say I got it because my dad was a smoker, secondhand smoke. But now that I think about it, that's around the time when my dad and mom, their relationship was really rocky. So the smoke, the stress, because that's when I learned um, that I had allergies, but they really weren't real allergies. They were just some some stuff they would say I'm as allergic to. And dog was one, but we always had dogs. So I don't know where it came from, but now, oh, I might have to think about that. And my grandbaby has eczema. So, and we didn't know where she got eczema from. So I'm going to have to ask my daughter a few questions here. Huh. Wow. Yeah, it's really interesting, too, because the more and more like when I went through my own, you know, childhood trauma and then I was researching, you know, just kind of nerding out on how does the body, you know, operate, right? Like, how do we operate with stress? What's interesting is that when you look into anxiety or stress, it's actually a protector for you. Like, it's, I know some people think it's like a bad thing, but anxiety and stress is actually a good thing because what your body does and in my instance, right? Right. 
when you're stressed out, um, mine's a little bit more apparent, right? I'll see it on my skin. But when a lot of people are stressed out, our body's inflammation fires up and it fires up to protect us. You know, if we're um, having allergies, because I have allergies too, but what's interesting is that when that flares up, you know, your body or your brain is telling you there's something wrong. Like there's something mm. that I need. Right. And it's so weird because like I have a inhaler. I have an EpiPen just because I'm severely allergic to all nuts and shellfish. <laughs> so I just have to be careful when I go to restaurants. You allergic um, to all nuts? All oh. nuts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is no. just so interesting because my mom, I get the allergies and the eczema and a yeah, lot. Yeah, and there's so many. Kind, yeah, there's always nuts in some type of product, nuts and soy. So it's just, yeah. man. Okay. All well, right. what's fun about that is that <laughs> while it sounds like horrible, like oh god, and I've definitely gotten the comments like, oh my god, you should like live in a bubble. When I list off my allergies, which is kind of rude. Um, thankfully, I get to psychoeducate people on this, but. Um, that's what's kind of interesting is that I, because I would do sports growing up and I would do swimming, it would open up my lungs. So with whatever was going on at home, I would go and like work out and do sports and it would open up my lungs. So I had asthma badly growing up. Um, I would even have to take my inhaler before I would swim. I can't even remember the last time I've had to take my inhaler since I've changed my diet, stress level, all of that. I carry them but I haven't had to use them in years. So Ooh. that's what's kind of just interesting when we do talk about um, relationships with others and what we witness and things that we go through in life, they affect us. They affect us on a biological level. And I've even done one of my PhD classes that I just did was about traumatic stress. And it was so cool because they talked about, you know, married couples and they wanted to do a thing of like who heals faster, right? If you get like a prick on your arm or something like that, who heals faster? And they, you know, interviewed a bunch of couples and they interviewed couples that had kind of been like disagreeing and just like having kind of like a rocky relationship versus couples that like had really good communication styles or, you know, different things. They felt loved and supported. What's so crazy, and I'm watching this video they did their research and they said those that like effectively communicate or, you know, obviously you're going to have arguments in relationships. Right. Right. What's so crazy is that the ones that had like that appropriate, like communication and the less stress and the less aggressiveness or anything like that, they healed faster. Like both, wow. parties, both parties healed, but the ones that were in that safer place or anything like that, they healed faster. They healed three times faster which is just like, what? <laughs> okay. Um, I'm really going to check into that with my asthma because I've changed my diet, been vegan, but I still have continued to struggle. But I wonder if there's some underlying stress that I'm not. Well, my dad's been, I've had different things happen. So, and then it goes back to the trauma. Man, I'm learning a lot today. I'm sorry. I'm just yip yapping about my life. Y'all want to get in here somewhere? Get in where you fit in, because I'll take the show. You know, I generally you know, be cycle, psychoanalyze me, and I'll be, I'll be right on time. Oh, my gosh. I just wanted to say real quickly, we want to thank um, everyone that's here with us. Toya Williams, you know, she's self-tiful, and she is coming through with the comments um, that are, are great, like nail-biting, nervous tics, hair thinning, all that stuff happens, right? Th those are all manifestations. She's truly, truly... Uh, telling the truth. So thank you, Toya. Um, also, love heals. We need each other to survive. That's right. Toya, thank you so much for being here, China. And just so you guys know, we're going to do a giveaway at the end of the show. So keep those comments coming because every comment is in giving you an entry into the drawing. Okay. Awesome. Nakia, what you got, sis? I am, I am struggling with I understand that everyone has a trauma, but how can I as as um as a mom support someone support my child with a trauma? How, how can I be supportive if she has a trauma? Like she was shot before, so she has PTSD. So when the fireworks go off, there's a problem. That type of thing. How do you support someone? Do you have to find out? Do you need to know what their trauma is to support them? Because what if she doesn't want to say or, you know, do you understand my question? 
Yeah, I definitely understand. Um, with trauma, I have seen, because um, a lot of my clients have gone through trauma and sometimes they won't you know, want to share everything that they've been through or, um, you know, there's even a stigma with suicidal thoughts or attempts or that kind of thing. And anything that I've seen, I've also had a background working with kids with autism, Down syndrome, kids and adults. And anything that I've witnessed within a family unit, um, and even with my own mother, um, she's seen me go through a lot of basically hell. <laughs> um, and I was bullied a lot and, and different things like that. And um, she would definitely feel helpless a lot of the times um, of not knowing what to do. And I will say from a personal level, and then I'll answer like therapy level, but from a personal level, my mom was always there. My dad was there, but he wasn't there, if that makes sense. If anyone knows anything about alcoholism, my dad wasn't there. <laughs> there, but not there. Uh, hasn't ever been. Uh, hence me being in therapy for seven plus years. <laughs> but, you know, personally, if, and I've had suicidal attempts and thoughts and all that kind of stuff. If my mom hadn't have been there, then I don't think I would be here today. And by being there, I mean, she just listened, whether I told her everything or not. I think when it comes to trauma, it's such a delicate, you know, topic. And sometimes when the, the topic of trauma, 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 trauma comes up, it's already overwhelming for that person. So I think if they want to talk about it, great. You just sit there and listen. If they don't want to, you know, talk about it, um, just asking things like, do you need anything? Um, you know, would you like me to find someone if you do want to talk to someone? You know, those kind of things, um, I think are just kind of that gentle approach. Like you're not treating them like they're glass or anything, but just kind of being present, honestly. And I know a lot of us want to be fixers, but with clients that have been through trauma, a lot of the time they just feel like their power or their voice or their safety was taken away. Um, so whatever that looks like of creating safety for them or, you know, anything like that, a lot of it is just gentle. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, as a therapist, I would say a lot of what has worked with my clients is, you know, because uh, unfortunately we have to do these like big assessments when they, when they come into the, you know, company. Um, and so that can be triggering, right? You're telling everyone you're schooling and past psychiatric hospitalizations and stuff. It's like a seven page thing. So mm -hmm. thankfully I go through it very carefully. And when I do hit that trauma section, I'm very careful of like how I phrase the questions and I'll preference it saying like, Hey, um, I know this might be a difficult topic to talk about, but, you know, if you want to share details, you can, or you can just say yes and no, dates and times. However, if you do share this information with me, this is, you know, your part of your documentation for forever, so you don't have to go into detail ever again. We update it every three years, but we do not go any, go through that, you know, trauma again um, every three years. So it's Jennifer, we have some questions for the floor. Mm -hmm. um, Latoya is asking, how do you help someone realize that they have trauma for the people that are in denial? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. I've seen this happen a lot, even with my friends. Um, they will be in denial that anything's wrong. And usually you'll see um, some kind of substance abuse issue, hypersexuality, some kind of difficulty having relationships, healthy relationships, that kind of thing. Um, sometimes we can't specifically say that like, hey, you've been through a trauma. You can phrase it because they might not define it, right? Like when I approach my clients and, you know, they've been through trauma, when I'm assessing that, I don't know what trauma is defined by in their vocabulary, right? Okay. Because okay. different cultures um, approach like approach the word trauma differently. So they might not, they might only think trauma is someone who served in a war. You know what I mean? So they might not even understand what the definition of trauma is. I would be more kind of focused on like, hey, I'm noticing that you're crying a lot. Like you're telling me you're crying every week or, um, 
I've kind of, you know, you've talked about how you've been having a lot of sex lately and you're enjoying it, but, but you're also telling me you're not using protection. How do oh, you okay. I was about to say, because having a lot of sex could be good for the trunk. Okay, never good, mind. But what if they're All right, doing, never, you know, Never mind. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you I was going to. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, no, sex is great. But, yeah. you know, it, it has to be like, okay, is there a danger for them to get STDs? Is there a danger to, you know, HPV for women? I mean, there's all these like different things that can come up. So I'd be more curious to, again, ask, you know, do you, do you notice anything wrong? Do you find it, you know, difficult to have friendships? you know, those kind of things. Um, you can also, you know, it, depending on the relationship with the person, like if you know the person really well, you can give them like screen. I've seen my friends do this before, give them screenshots of what trauma is and what it looks like. There's a lot of really good like infographs out there. And you could like, if you're close with this person and they won't take it the wrong way, then you can say like, hey, you know, I noticed that you're going through something. Um, I want to send this to you and just tell me your thoughts, you know, and it might just open the door of conversation. Um, but a lot of it is we don't know how the other person is defining it. We don't know if they don't want to. I've also seen this a lot. If they don't want to attach, like acknowledge their trauma, it might be because that could be their security blanket, too. I've I've seen that happen. People can go through traumatic events and use that as a security blanket saying, this is all life is, life is terrible, you can't trust anyone, blah, blah, blah. But, I, you know, again, I don't come down on them because if you're saying, oh, I can't trust anyone, then you're telling me all this trauma history. Well, no wonder. No wonder you don't feel safe. No wonder you can't trust anyone. Does that ever feel lonely? You know, or are you okay with it? So it kind of it kind of depends on how it's impacting the person. That's what we look at a lot with diagnosis. Like, how is it impacting the person? You know, some people are like, no, I'm fine. I'm great. You know, <laughs> but you notice, you know, chronic health issues, relationship issues, that kind of thing. Uh, so China, you, <laughs> yeah, you may have kind of an answered this, but China says, how can you get someone to see their denial about the effect of the abuse? If that makes sense. Oh, she actually wrote another comment. I had yeah. spoke to someone about it and they fired back at me and I left her alone. Yeah. So. When it does come to trauma, I've also seen that when you try to go and help the person, they lash out, right? And that's usually a trauma response right there. They, they might be lashing out because now you're seeing that there's something wrong and they uh -huh. might not want to address it, right? They might not want to address it, whether it's fear of going crazy, you know, anything like that. Um, people might not want to address that um and you can try like i've i've tried to um there was one girlfriend i had who i you know noticed that she had messaged me saying like oh my you know well now it's her husband my husband like is uh, drinking a lot and i'm worried and i've feared for my life and stuff and then it was interesting because then on facebook she would post that they were an amazing couple and incredible and da 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 da, da. And I just gently said, you know, do you know what a healthy relationship look like? Like, how do you define a healthy relationship? And then she kind of talked about it. And then I was able to talk to her. But then sometimes I have approached people and they lash out, right? Um, you can do your best to be there for someone who's been through trauma. Um, a lot of the time, they don't want that judgment, you know? Um, they might be internally going through that war already in a sense of that that, you know, maybe replaying it over and over and over again. All you can do if you're definitely not like a therapist and if you're a friend or a family member is just honestly nine out of 10 times when I've ever seen a family unit work in a good way or a couple or anything like that. A lot of it is just like being there, offering support, but also having boundaries because boundaries are a big one because um, sometimes that'll that'll come up too. So it's, it's hard. Sometimes people don't want to address the trauma, but look at it from the sense that that might be their security blanket and they weren't, they don't know anything else. So they might lash out to be like, no, I'm fine. I'm good. That might be the only thing that they know. 
So you can give resources, you know, anything like that, but some people just might not want to take it. Oh. It's kind of like if somebody has a chronic health issue, you know, they're, they're going to choose to go to the doctor or not, right? Sometimes you can't drag them in there. So, yes. so Nakia, what do you think, like, for, for our children? You know, the question that you asked, what, what do you think? I mean, I think what you said is, is, is good, you know, just yeah. being there. I mean, there's been plenty of times where she doesn't want to talk and she is yeah. lashing out. You just have to sit there and let her know that you're you're present. You know, I'll text her from another room and be like, do you need something? You know, while the fireworks are going off. And, and she's like, no, I just want to be left alone. So, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think that just being there is is all we could do. I love that. And, and that takeaway, listen, you know, sometimes I don't want to listen, but mama just got to listen. You yeah. know, let her know that, that I'm there. So that's good. Thank you. So what about identifying these healthy relationships? Yes. What would you like to know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will go first. Cool. I feel as though I don't have a healthy relationship because my husband doesn't communicate well. And I know why. And I accept why. But I want to make it better. So how do you make it better? Yes. So communication is a big one in relationships. Um, I'm in a relationship and, and communication is such a big one. Um, I think what it is like when it comes to communication is you want to communicate your needs, right? In every relationship, there are things that you are like, okay with. And then there's like deal breakers, right? Of like, like for me, I'm allergic to cigarette smoke, so I could never date a smoker, right? That would totally be a deal breaker. Um, but when it comes to the communication, um, obviously, you know, you're trying to work it out and, and you know, different things. And um, if you understand his why, I think sometimes even using the person's why might help. So for instance, uh, if someone, and I've seen this in a relationship, if someone is more um, introverted versus extroverted, Right. Um, sometimes you can uh, sit there and ask them, you know, what do they need or that kind of thing. But if you feel like there's no communication coming back, right, like if they're not communicating with you. Um, I have a book, actually. Let me grab it. There's a really good book about this. I never thought about that. Understanding their why. I mean, I understand his why. I mean, it's the way he was raised and everything. But, you know, you can't have a conversation with one person and if i'm sitting here giving you the, the this is how i feel and you are i don't know what you're talking about that's so you say you so what so what what would you how would you define what is his why i understand you're saying the way he grew up so what I is think, his i think it's the way he grew up and and not having communication in his home he never learned mm -hmm. yeah if he's never learned a lot of role playing can can help. Um, okay. For instance, a lot of my clients they don't come from happy homes. They don't come come from healthy boundaries even, um, and so they don't know how to have healthy boundaries. You know, again, when we've been going through things in life, we don't have the blueprint. You know, number one, we're born into this world, and then we start forming attachments and learning things. Right? If you're thinking about babies and stuff, um, we all have to learn as we go. What's you know. And if we don't have healthy attachments growing up, that does cause sometimes um, an issue in adulthood. But a lot of the time, if they want to communicate, but it's like hard for them, a lot of role playing um, can be really, really helpful. Um, so if so they- Do you, do you mean they role wanna, playing as in, I act like him and he acts like me, or do you mean role playing? You could do it, you could do it like that, or you could say, what is, what is something you're trying to talk about? And if they say, I don't know. I want you to do the chores more. <laughs> if they're trying to tell you that, then I would say, oh, what's that? That's a good one. Yeah. So if they're saying, I want you to do the chores more, or I need help uh, in, in the chores more, then they could sit there and say, okay, so I want you to say to me, can you help me with the chores? And let's try to practice being specific, like what chores, right? Because I won't be able to read your mind. So which chores, right? And you can like role play and just give him a sentence and you can be like, well, how does that feel? Does it feel a little awkward? That's okay if it feels awkward. We're okay. practicing. 
you know. <clears throat> There's also this really, really, really good book. Um, it has countless uh, things like how to translate, don't mention it, don't feel that way, haven't we talked about this before? Um, but I am listening, that'll come up in relationships. It's uh, this book, okay. The Lost Art of Listening, and let me hold up the author. Oops. Okay, Michael Nichols. Yes, Michael Nicholas, and it's The Lost Art mm -hmm. of Listening. Um, and it's really good. I mean, it goes into, I mean, it goes into exercises that you can do with your partner. Um, did you hear what I said? Thanks for listening. Why don't people listen? Um, you, why do you always overreact? That can happen in relationships. Yes. Um, all that. So this is like one of my like number one books that I usually recommend for couples that nice any issues, cool. you know, communicating. I will definitely go get that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it has little exercises. You can also be really fun. And there's, if you're trying to like encourage them to communicate, because a lot of guys sometimes, you know, they're just not born communicators sometimes, depending on, you know, how they are. Some of them can. Um, but there's also like, it's really cute. You can go onto Amazon and there's like um, questions that you can ask each other or fun board games that you can do, um, those kind of things. So. Cool. And yeah. that book and with those examples sound like something we should uh, should be in our arsenal, not just when we're having issues, but, you know, just yeah. in general. Yeah, so yeah. Cool. thank you, Jennifer. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Janet, do you have any questions about identifying healthy relationships? No, I've asked all my questions. Um... <laughs> I can add to um, some of the things that I've seen clients go through is one of them is I've seen this happen to a lot of women. Why do I mm -hmm. keep attracting a toxic man? <laughs> That's a big one that comes up. I've even seen this with my girlfriends and I'm like, do you really want to hear the answer? Um, <laughs> it's like, you want to Give it to a or like, <laughs> you know, um, and obviously I obviously my friends know I'm like, I'm not therapizing you because hello, I, you know, that's ethically wrong. Legally, I can get in trouble. But um, when it comes to that, it's it's recognizing patterns, right? So, for instance, some of my friends have gone through and have not had a healthy relationship um, attached to a mom or a dad, right? And so later on in life, say father was an alcoholic, well, they can sometimes gravitate towards people that dismiss their needs or are not there or you know anything like that right and sometimes some people are aware of it sometimes subconsciously you're not aware of it right because if that's all you know sometimes you gravitate towards it and you don't even realize it right but i think a really big part of identifying healthy relationships is you know what are the needs that you have as just yourself right before you're dating anyone else right before you're dating anyone else uh, before you're like involved with like you know family family and stuff right you want to look at like what are your needs do you feel like you're being heard do you feel safe do you feel like your needs are always pushed to the ground and their needs are always first well wait a minute why aren't your needs ever considered right kind of getting curious of like well you know, and some, some people have been through a lot of domestic violence relationships, right? And a lot of the time when women or men or whoever is going through that, a lot of it has to go back to some kind of attachment that happened. Because when DV happens, you do have that choice, right? Now, I know a lot of people get on everyone about like, why do they stay? Why do they stay if their partner hits on them or whatever? We don't know what their attachment is. Do they only know abuse and violence and that's what they think and attach to that that's love? We don't know, right? And I have heard women stay in relationships because that's all they knew. They didn't, they never got to see what healthy love looked like, right? So they, that's all that they knew. They just knew, oh, well, I have kids with this person. I'm, you know, whatever. But they never got along the way that self-love aspect of like, well, wait a minute, your safety should never be put at risk wait a minute, yes, couples yell, but should names be called? You know, is that really necessary, 
right? I've gotten into arguments and I haven't called people names. So like, come on, there's like some time of like, okay, but do you really feel happy? Do you really feel safe, right? And so I, I have seen those patterns happen a lot. Um, and sometimes you don't know that that person is toxic until they show their true colors. I actually went through a divorce and oh lord it did not need to escalate to this level but basically he as soon as i started advancing in my career we weren't even married for two years and after that first year of marriage then his true colors start showing he starts saying things to put me down he starts drinking very heavily um like every night and then there was different situations so it's like okay we need to just file for divorce like clearly you're checked out this isn't working and I had been trying to take him to couples counseling. I found a very incredible individual therapist for him, but he was so ingrained and attached to his trauma, he refused to let it go. And that's when I realized, yeah, no, I was raised in a domestic violence home. I am not gonna let this, I know where it's gonna go. So based on that, you know, I had to start, you know, protecting myself and looking into resources and stuff. And of course, all the resources are like, oh, well, we're not gonna do anything until he hits you. Excuse me? Excuse me? And I'm telling you, I talked to a female cop on the phone. I talked to different organizations, domestic abuse hotline, all that kind of stuff. They were like, no, we can't do anything for you. You can go to a shelter. And I was like, I have an animal. Where am I supposed to take it? It's a gecko. It's not like I can like plug it in or leave it at somebody's house. <laughs> it's like, a little bit more difficult. And I'm allergic to animals. So a lot of shelters in LA have animals on site. So what am I supposed to do? And I have sheets to detergent on, you know, like allergies to certain detergents that's used on bed sheets. I'm like, there's no way I could do this. If I have to, I'll live in my car. That's fine. But like, come on. And so, you know, what's so interesting is that unfortunately I had to, I had to, I tried to call the cops on him. They never came, but then he calls the cops on me one night <laughs> after I took the beer out of the fridge, I put it outside the door and I said, please go drink somewhere else. I need safety. I need peace. He obviously gets aggressive, starts, you know, calling 911. I record everything on my phone because I was like, what? And, you know, cops come and I'm crying and shaking out of the, you know, apartment. And they sit there and they're like, they're thinking they're coming for me. They're the aggressive, you know, wife that's there. I am not aggressive at all. And I'm like, okay, so they come up the elevator and I'm already in trauma response because I'm crying, I'm shaking. I had been dealing with this kind of stuff for over a year, trying to fight to save and get him help. Obviously not my job, but you know, you're in that moment at that time. And the cops come and I'm telling them everything. I said, I have pictures, I have text messages, I have all of this, I'm trying to do something. I can't break the lease, I can't afford it, blah, blah, blah. He won't leave, his friends that enable him won't bail him out and let him stay at his place. And they're like, well, you might be able to qualify for a restraining order. And I'm like, I got to escalate it to this. And so unfortunately, I did have to get a restraining order because he refused to leave and all these different things. And it's just so interesting because then I started after, you know, that happened and everything like that. I started learning about narcissism abuse and how they subtly do it and all these things. And I remember being like, and I heard the things from people oh, you're a therapist. You should have known all the warning signs and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You must not be that good of a therapist. And I'm like, seriously? Number one, why are we shaming someone that went away from a domestic violence and got out? And what? And then the churches would be like, oh, well, you're just not praying hard enough. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I hate that. Mm, let's just say that irks me every time. And I actually specifically asked God for a scripture because everybody was telling me I wasn't praying hard enough and I need to go home and pray the demons out of him. And I was like, which Bible are you reading? Because Jesus walked and led by example. He didn't force himself on anyone. He says, That's come right. and knock at the door. Hello. Like he doesn't bust through the door. Like <laughs> what and hold you down? You know, like what are you talking about? And it was interesting because when I was going through everything, I asked for scripture and I Ask God, I was like, give me a scripture because I feel like you're saying divorce, not separation. That's weird for me. And God gave me a scripture in Malachi. I think it's like Malachi 316 or something like that. I'm really bad at specific, but it's in Malachi. And it does talk about how he is not supposed to bring violence to his wife. And he's supposed to treat her like a precious garment. Mm -hmm. And back then, if you know anything about the Bible, precious garment, those clothes and those things were very rare and high end and high priced. So I was like, 
All right, whoever tells me again that, like, <laughs> you know. Um, but going back to that is saying, you know, sometimes we don't know, right? Like there was little warning signs, but we had, we had drank together. You know, I had seen him drunk before, never to this level. But I don't know how he thought marrying a trauma therapist, his trauma wouldn't manifest if he hadn't healed from it. Don't know why he thought he could escape that. But, you know, I did the thing of like, listen, clearly you need healing. I didn't marry a horrible person, but I think you are just so deep in your trauma that clearly I'm activating you and I'm activating healing. You don't want to get done. This needs to stop because safety does not need to be. But see, here's the thing. If I didn't learn, because I grew up in a household that I had no example of what a healthy relationship was. No offense to my mother, but she knows this. She stayed in the relationship for 20 some odd years. You know, and she says she stayed for me and my brother, but me and my brother were in our like early teens saying, get out. Like, what are y'all doing? You're all clearly not happy. So your kids know. Right. And it's it's very hard. And I get why people stay. And sometimes you guys, people can um, heal relationships and get help and, you know, all of that. But, you know, if you're feeling unsafe in a relationship, that's not healthy. I don't care if it's a friendship or a romantic relationship. That's not healthy. Like what? And if you feel like you don't have a voice, if you feel like, say, for instance, some people set boundaries of no sex before marriage. Some people set boundaries of um, if you're coming over my place, I need you, you know, need you to follow some kind of rule or something like that. Right. And they keep disregarding it. Well, wait a minute. Do you feel like that's disrespectful or are you OK with that? Right. Sometimes we don't we don't know these things, but. You have to look at, um, and there's a really good worksheet that I can send everyone, but there's a good worksheet out there. Um, it's therapistaid.com, and it's a worksheet on relationships, and it shows, like, what's an unhealthy relationship and what is an unhealthy relationship. And a lot of the characteristics are, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Do you have a voice? Do you feel heard? Do you always put their needs before yours? And a lot of that, again, even on identifying healthy relationships, will go back to self-love. If we don't love ourselves we can let anyone and everyone topple all over us and just disregard you versus if you do build that self-love and self-confidence, you won't allow those people to do that. You know, you'll be like, nope, nope. You won't even like let them in that like protected space that you've created. But again, that's very hard. Yeah. Yeah, that can be very hard indeed. I totally agree. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Just, I just clearly you have to come back. There's just more to, to talk about. <laughs> so really quickly, guys, um, this is uh, Minority Mental Health Month. Yes, indeed. So this is this subject matter is right on time. And we wanted to share really quickly um, from Mindful and Melanated. They have some cool stuff coming up here. Add that here. All right. So in observation of minority or BIPOC Mental Health Awareness Month, Mindful and Melanated will be hosting a speaker series for black and brown women called My Mental Health is Not Minor. Love that. During the month of July, Regina Renee, founder of Mindful and Melanated, will be interviewing three BIPOC women who will share their experience, their expertise in areas such as mental health in the workplace, restorative practices, and the importance of peer support. So join us Thursdays, July 15th, 22nd, and 29th at 7 p.m. EST for these intimate discussions on mental health, mental wellness issues concerning black and brown women. And you can register for the event by going to the Mindful and Melanated Facebook page. So search for Mindful and Melanated and there it is on the screen and you can register for these events. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now we Thank have the you. giveaway. To give away, to give away. <laughs> Jennifer, what are we giving away, sis? <laughs> First of all, before we go to that, I uh, just want to quickly say that if anyone ever has uh, any questions, concerns, um, needing books, I'm a big book and research article nerd or psychologytoday.com kind of nerd. Mm -hmm. um, if you guys ever need like any resource on, hey, I'm trying to heal from this um, and you just want resources, you can always DM me on Instagram. Um, but yes, as far as the giveaway, um, I'm currently working on some eBooks. So I'm working on an eBook 
um, talking about like the basics of healing from trauma. And then I'm also doing one um, on like the power of social media and how to, you know, do marketing. So I am working on those two eBooks. I have to find a platform and kind of design it because I'm totally not like a full on, you know, graphic designer. Um, so I will be giving away two eBooks. Um, you can pick which topic you want, all that good stuff. Um, I'm not sure when it'll come out, but as long as I have your information, you'll be one of the first people to get it for free. So that's what we're giving away today. All right. Y'all ready for the drawing? Yep. Yay. Let's go. About to say, huh? <laughs> I know. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. Yeah. All right, China. China. Yes, China. Congratulations, sis. And you guys are going nice. to email me the information of them, right? Yes. 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 Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Yay. Do we want to do the second one too? Yep. We're going to do the second one as well. Yay. Okay. Okay. So, like, I'm not set up for the second one. This yes. is. Oh, okay. You're welcome, China. Yeah, I'll be in touch with you, China, in uh, order to say, like, which one do you want, that kind of thing. Let's see if we can do it real quickly here. And so do they choose which one or which was the first drawing for? They can they choose could, uh, which topic, yeah, if they want, like, marketing tips or if they want something about, like, trauma and that kind of thing. All right. So let's get it going again. All right. Let's see. Share screen. All right. Mm -hmm. See? Everybody yeah. loves everybody yeah. loves free. Yeah. Right? Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see what we got. Yay. Roll the dices. Roll the dices. If Sultiple wins, if you want to Sultiple won. Ah, <laughs> so, so we we could take it. And give it away yeah. at our conference. This, yes, we could. That's what we'll do. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That'd be awesome, a great awesome. giveaway. Early giveaway <laughs> for our 2022 BA World Conference. I'd like that. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm definitely willing to come back and talk about anything, you know, mental health, relationships, all that. Yeah. Well, it was a great informative show, especially since yeah. we're still focusing on um, mental health. You gave us so many caveats of different things, whether it's relationships, even health wise, you know, trauma, mm -hmm. we just have to be oh, yeah. mindful of what our traumas are. Yeah, we really do. And and I know somebody mentioned a comment about uh, being in a relationship and sometimes they can show you the areas where you need to heal from. And that does happen. Sometimes when you're in a healthy relationship, you'll be like, oh, I still got some weeds or well, I got a lot of weeds I need to work on. Um, and my my boyfriend, soon to be fiance, um, he Yay, is Yay, incredible, and I've never felt so loved and safe. But I don't think I would have met that kind of person had I not done the years of therapy, mm -hmm. the identifying, the working on self love. It, it just I don't think it would have happened. So I just want to say, you know, everyone can have a redemption story. <laughs> so. yes. Sure can, sure can. <laughs> Me and my. Me and my husband, we weren't great communicators. So we went, Boop! and mm -hmm. now it's a totally different person. I mean, mm -hmm. he is more communicative. Now, he's Caribbean, so he's not as like mm -hmm. somebody would be, but he's mm -hmm. so much better. And I kind of mm -hmm. understand now things. Mm -hmm. I even understand more about how stressful his work is. Yeah. So, and now he's come to understand as stressful how mine can be. So it's mm -hmm. just, We've, we've opened up more and communicated more. Yeah, nice. sometimes that happens. You know, there's a rift and it can be mended. It just kind of depends on if both parties are open and willing. So That's what it depends on. That's right. We both got to do the work. It's not one person in a relationship. <laughs> what she said. <laughs> you know, but Amen. you both have to have like that self-love, self-confidence. It's, it's hard. It's difficult to build that. But you can start somewhere. Yeah, for sure. Mm hmm well, thanks, ladies. Great. This is so much fun. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for all done. the information that you gave us. Definitely. And the giveaways, yes. Yes. Woo -woo.
All right. So if you will, guys, make sure you like, comment, make sure you subscribe to our channel. We're so grateful for our beautiful guests. We're looking forward for you to come back again, especially um, all that you give us during this mental health uh, month that's uh, geared to minorities, which is, is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, we thank you and we'll see y'all later. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, and welcome to Soul Support.